Promoting mindful well-being in everyday life. This is the Pragmatic Alchemy Podcast with your host, Courtney Edwards. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Pragmatic Alchemy. My name is Courtney Edwards, and I'm your host. Today, we are welcoming Susan Wilson to the show. I reached out to Susan in the fall after reading her book, Making Sense of Menopause, at the advice of a friend of mine whose wisdom and insights I trust implicitly. And I'm so glad that I did because this book is amazing. The next episode is pretty much one hour of me fangirling. Susan, to her credit, keeps herself calm and collected and cool and keeps us focused so that she can share with our listening audience, her wealth of information on the menopause transition. I have to admit that reaching out to Susan is maybe one of the boldest acts I've ever committed as a podcast host because I don't have any history with her. I just really was so impacted by her book that when I saw an opportunity to bring her on the show, I had to pursue it. And so I I found her, I sent her an email, I said, please, she said yes. And I am eternally grateful, and I'm hopeful that after you listen, you're going to feel grateful for her being on the show too. I would also really highly recommend that everybody discard any preconceived notions you might have about who this episode is for. It is not just for women in their 40s and 50s. It is for anybody with a uterus that may or is going through the menopause transition. It is for the partners of folks who may or are going through the menopause transition. It's for anybody who wants to hear some deep truths about what it's like to move through the world in a female body. Anybody that wants to understand the genetic and environmental precursors to our whole lifespan development, including the type of menopause we might have. This was such a fun conversation to have. I did try to stay professional, although I think that you can hear the excitement and the enthusiasm and the awe and respect in my voice. Susan was an amazing guest. The book is an amazing gift. I hope you listen. I hope you read the book. I hope you tell us what you thought about it. Let's get started. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm delighted to be here and talk to you. I have been dreaming of this moment (laughs) for several months. Um, We're going to talk a bit about your book um, because that is what led me to you and wanting to have this conversation. And so we can start there, that you are the author of Making Sense of Menopause, um, a book that I am just obsessed with and in love with that is about menopause, but a whole bunch of other stuff. And I hope that a lot of our conversation gets to focus on that other stuff. But why don't we start with you kind of telling us a little bit about your work and who you are and how you came to write this amazing book. Okay. Um, I'm a nurse midwife and have been for more years than I care to think about. Um, I've always been interested in cross-cultural work and in the larger view of things. I've, I've always, my brain likes to connect dots and see how things relate to each other. So I've worked in several cultures and I feel like, um, the birth traditions of a culture can tell you a lot about what they value. Mm -hmm. And my early studies were in child development. So I became very interested in um, who we are at a young age and how that shapes and, and forms us. And once I became a midwife, I also became very interested in infant consciousness and what babies know in the womb and what we're capable of as human beings from even before we're born that so many parents are not aware of. And it all leads me to think a lot about what is a human being and how do we evolve? So, um, 
you know, I've really approached my work from that point of view. And I'm very interested in nature and how she works and how things are put together. So I really see life as a continuum. And it's one thing that made me write the book the way I did. I see, you know, a woman's biological life as a continuum menopause is part of that. We're prepared for it biologically. Nature has a very step-by-step way of preparing us. And yet most of us as women, you know, and certainly as a culture, menopause is kind of plucked out of the rest of our lives and set aside as this thing that's going to happen to us and buckle up. It's going to be horrible. Mm. So, um, You know, I really, I spent the last 20 years of my clinical practice working with menopausal women and noticed that it was a kind of a fork in the road for us that we either moved forward into this stage of our life thriving, or we began to diminish and kind of fade away. And I was very curious about what made that happen? You know, what made that choice go one way or the other for women? So I I was a big fan of women telling their stories. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much from that. Yeah. And and I think that that what you're just mentioning is one of the things that makes the book so brilliant, which is it doesn't just talk about menopause. When you're asking that question of, you know, what shaped you to pick one of these two avenues at the fork in the road, you're looking then at that individual's experience three months prior to conception, which was one of my favorite parts about this book, because, you know, as a mental health professional, uh, you know, a lot of my training also looked at early attachment and experiences in infancy. But this was kind of the first time that I, I heard it posed as up to three months prior to to conception. And my brain just went, I was blown away. And it made me want to ask my mom a billion questions that I have not yet worked up the urge to ask her. (laughs) Or or the courage, I should say, not the the urge is there, the courage is missing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting, when we unraveled the human genome, we found far, far fewer genes than we thought we would because Mm -hmm. we were seeing genes as causative. You have a gene for blonde hair, a gene for brown eyes, a gene for skin color, that sort of thing. But they found really that our DNA is just this amazing storehouse of potential. And what actually triggers it to express in one way or another is our environment. And so this whole new science of epigenetics came into being that really is understanding that it we are made to survive. And so as beings that need to be flexible to survive in many different kinds of environments, we need to have a way for that to happen. So as it turns out, our environments trigger our gene expression. And yes, three months prior to our conception is when nature's kind of lining up um, the gene coding in the egg that will become us. And she takes her cues from the kind of environment that um, we find ourselves in, because that's what we're going to need to match and survive in. So Mm -hmm. if our mother is extremely stressed, or if she was a chronic smoker, or anything that would make the environment tricky, um, our genes get loaded that way. And a baby who is in the womb of a mother who's overstressed will have a much um, more sensitive hair trigger to jump into fight or flight because that's how our biology survives is by going into fight or flight. So Mm -hmm. a baby that had been in the womb of a very stressed mom will have that trigger that releases more quickly and will pile up more stress response in their life, which will definitely affect them when they come to menopause. Right, right. And I think part of my experience, and then really one of the things I hear frequently from people I work with is this question of, 
you know, how did I end up this way <laughs> with whatever it is that we struggle with? And, and I can remember working with various clients over the years. And, and again, even in some of my own reflections of my mental health struggles of just trying to unravel, look for one experience as a young person to be like, oh, this is what happened. And then I became this way. And it was really liberating almost to, um, to read, well, no, this is just wiring now. <laughs> you know, it wasn't one thing. And I think it took a lot of that pressure off of trying to, to really kind of whittle it down to this one pristine, concrete moment in time that, that led to anxiety or depression or whatever it is that people struggle with to just be like, or, you know, genetic <laughs> expression, because there were some environmental factors that led to that particular expression. I found that actually really like peaceful and freeing. Yes. And I think it helps us to have compassion for ourselves, which is so critical if we're really going to evolve and become fully who we are, because there may have been two or three um, incidents or something that kind of anchors a, a point of view in us, because up until about six years of age, we pretty much download our experience as truth. We don't have the analytic capacity yet to look at it and say, oh, mom's having a bad day or, you know, my dad just lost his job and we don't have any money and that's why this is happening. Um, and then once we've kind of downloaded that, we tell our stories over and over again, that story about ourselves, and it becomes more and more true as we get older, because we tell the same thing all the time. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I felt was important was to have people go back and question some of this, you know, whose voice was it really that told me I was rebellious or stupid or whatever the adjective is that we apply to ourselves that's negative? Because it could have been a teacher, it could have been um, you know, a random person that our mother, you know, uh, really focused on and felt embarrassed about. It could have been anything. And um, we take that on at a very early stage and begin to identify ourselves by that. So being curious, asking the questions of, of ourselves, well, you know, what was that? And it can be fascinating if you still have a parent alive and they're willing to talk about it to sit down and hear some of the stories of what was really happening behind the scenes that your three-year-old or six-year-old brain and personality couldn't really ferret out. Um, mm -hmm. I recently sat down with my 94-year-old mother and was just, you know, probing her a little more about her early life, which led to opening up a whole new <laughs> set of information that I hadn't even been aware of. Right. Oh, that's amazing. And such a gift, you know, to be able to, to explore that. Um, what yeah. you were just saying <clears throat> reminded me of one of the exercises in the book. So I'll, I'll mention to listeners who haven't read it yet. First of all, read it. Making Sense <laughs> of Menopause, Susan Wilson. Find it wherever you find it and read it because it's brilliant. Um, but I loved the exercises at the end of each chapter, the reflections and the uh, you know journaling prompts. And, and one that really struck me was you know, to think about a story that you tell of yourself, of who you are, go back to the origin of that story and try to tell it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that I feel like to talk about self-compassion, you know, that to me feels like such a, a simple um, point of reflection or a journaling prompt, but can be so profound to just start to just shift that narrative, particularly if it's a socialized uh, narrative of who you should be, to be able to reframe it, to say, well, you know, this is maybe how I want to see that specific experience, or this is how I want it to show up in my life now. Or even as an older person looking back at it and being able to separate, well, this is what actually happened, and this is the story I tell myself mm -hmm. about what it meant. I've received a couple of emails from women that have said doing that particular exercise that you just brought up changed their life in terms of how they look at who they are in the world and what they're capable of. And 
you know, I think it's always, especially when we're dealing with really early information, you know, I think it's very helpful to look back with an adult perspective and the experience that we've gained and say, oh, well, that's interesting. This is what I was told. This is what I experienced and always thought. But you know what? Maybe that wasn't really what was going on. And it can release a lot of stuff. Oh, for sure. That's so profound to just sit with that, use the word curiosity before and to look at it and be like, the -hmm. story that I told, is that really true? (laughs) And Mm -hmm. when you get to that point where you're like, well, maybe it wasn't really true or maybe there was a different way. Like, yeah, I could definitely see how somebody would describe that as life changing. It just seems like such a, a piece of magic. You know, the, the podcast is called Pragmatic Alchemy, and that feels like alchemy. <laughs> I think it is. And um, really, you know, our earliest experiences do shape the menopause that we're going to have. And I think that's one reason why, well, that and the information about the continuum of a woman's biology and how each step leads to the next, how we're being prepared, how we can be proactive. I think all of that is a reason that that this book can be useful to much younger women than those who actually find themselves in menopause. But it's strange that most of us don't really think about it till we find ourselves in the middle of it. And that was even true with me. And I'd had, I've been um, in women's health, taking care of women since I was 24 years old. That was a long, long time ago, but things start to happen. You're busy. You don't notice them. You go, Oh, you know, am I low in this nutrient or, you know, why is my skin changing or why is this happening or my sleep a little different? And you don't even think about it. And strangely, um, many of the symptoms that we have in menopause at some other time of our life, if we were expressing those symptoms, they might actually indicate something going on with our health. And many women do fear that something is seriously wrong when they begin to have these symptoms because they don't associate it with menopause. And sadly, many doctors that we go to see don't either. You know, a menopausal woman can go in for a visit for something that's going on with her and the doctor will do what they usually do. They run a million tests. They look at them. They say, your tests are normal. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. The implication being, (laughs) um, you know, you're making this up. You're oversensitive. You're overstressed, whatever the particular overlay is that we mm-hmm. want to take on. And we we just don't think about it. So right. quite often, you know, women will find themselves in the throes of, you know, difficult symptoms before they realize what's going on. And then they're just looking to be fixed. They don't have the psychic energy to be doing this exploration that we're talking about. Right. So to begin to do it early can both um, open things up, but it can also seriously change the menopause that you experience. Right, right. Yeah, there's so much there to what you just said. One of the things before we came on the air, we were talking about the psychopathology class that I'm teaching right now. And and one of the things that I see, you know, to your point, which is, you know, there's clearly symptoms, no tests are going to catch menopause, so to speak, right? Because it's a basic natural biological function. And so women are dismissed. Yes. Or it's acknowledged as menopause and they're dismissed because you should just suck it up, right? This is just that you, you, whatever your symptoms are, this is just menopause. And so they're dismissed as like, well, you just should get through this. There's no actual help. Or I think sometimes what happens in the other direction is there is something else, a psychological condition, a medical condition that is written off as menopause. Yes. Oh, you're, you're just going through menopause. But either way, the experience that she's enduring is dismissed. Yes. The other thing I think is is an issue, or at least this has kind of been an issue for me, is um, we don't talk about it, right? Like when we're 12, they sit us down in gym class and they talk to us about menstruation. Right. And nobody sits us down when we're 30 and says, and here's going to be the next phase. And in my particular situation, My grandmother had a hysterectomy in her 40s. My mother has thyroid dysfunction, which caused her to go through an almost immediate menopause in her early 40s. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have 
anybody to ask, which is why I went looking for books, which is how I found yours, because I've had to find this information out on my own, mm -hmm. you know, because I don't have any menopausal role models, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we're really the first generation to talk openly about it. And right now there seems to be an explosion of menopause books. Um, sadly, most of them are diet and exercise books that, um, that are telling you, oh, if you just follow my 10-step program, you don't have to age, which I think is exactly the wrong message. Right. Um, but I think it's why what you're saying, I think it's why it's so important for us to tell our stories and to share this. And it's why always in my visits, I allowed time for that because it's such an important piece of information. And, and one thing that you find out really, I think, as you begin to talk is that all our secrets are the same secret, really. We're all human beings. We've been taught to look good in our culture, whatever that means to you, whether it's, you know, the way you dress or having enough money or having a certain amount of power in your community. We're, we're taught to put on the facade that, hey, everything's okay. I'm, you know, I'm feeling confident, competent, everything's together. And so we keep um, some of our more vulnerable parts inside. We keep these experiences that are part of the human experience close to our chest as secrets. And once we start to talk to each other, we find out that this thing that we've been holding on to, that we have allowed to make us feel less than and not powerful and not in charge of our own lives, is really the same thing everyone else is holding on to. And that can also be really liberating. So mm -hmm. I like to suggest that um, women put together what I think of as a menopause posse, you know, some of their uh, friends, whether they be same age, whether they be a little older, a little younger, because I think succession is very important that we pass on what we know and get together, maybe read the book together, do a book club, answer some of the questions, tell your stories, because they're so, so important. And we find out more about ourselves when we do. Right. When I was close to completing the book, I posted something on my social media about it just to, you know, mm -hmm. spread the word. And I said, you know, how impressed I was, how how informational and, and brilliant I found it. And then I said, and now all I want to do is put together a coven of gray haired, <laughs> yep. softly rounded, finely yep. wrinkled wisdom holders, because yep. this book gave permission in a way I had never experienced before to go ahead and just get old, mm -hmm. to have some wrinkles, to, to, you know, have curves, to be soft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to, you know, sprinkle out the nuggets that really just like rocked my world. And one of them was the idea that we are one of two species that live beyond menopause. Mm -hmm. right? Am I correct that it's two? It's us and whales? As, as I know. <laughs> yeah, there are certain species of whale that also does. And they uh, impart their wisdom much in the same way that we do. We're right. the wisdom holders as grandmothers. Yes. And you know, there's a lot of research being done on that right now called the grandmother hypothesis that really shows that it was the older women that furthered the evolution of the species because they were not as uh, focused on, you know, child growing, child <laughs> rearing, um, and they could have the longer view and could you know, tell the stories of their tribe, hold that wisdom. And many mm -hmm. indigenous cultures, really the, the status of older women is the highest you get. They're the ones that decide. I want that. <laughs> I love that idea. I mean, that just feels so powerful in the face of so many societal messages suggesting that after a certain age, somebody moving through the world in a woman's body should just disappear, you know, yeah. that we become invisible, that we're no longer attractive, we're no longer, you know, viable as partners or whatever the case is to just be like, well, no, actually now you are 
you are the sustainers of this whole culture. Like that right. to me, I'm like, yes, we need more of that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That was, that was such a remarkable thing um, to learn about, you know, and I'd heard the grandmother hypothesis before, but not as, you know, didn't quite understand it until I, I read through your work and, and just applauded just so much because I just thought that that was such a great, a great message, you know, because we are, we're going to get older, <laughs> you know? So I, I think it can be easier to accept it when it is, um, the perspective has been shifted into a positive and a strength and an asset instead of just what you no longer have. Right. And that is the way so many women experience menopause, looking back mm -hmm. over their shoulder at what they've lost. Mm -hmm. But it's also important to realize, you know, the things that we have um, done. And I love that older women tend to not care as much what people are going to think of them. And they think, if not now, when? You know, now's the time. And Actually, the hormones that run our reproductive system, the estradiol, which is the major estrogen that runs the menstrual cycle, kind of puts us in a bit of a hormonal trance because it's stimulating the part of the brain that, of course, makes us want to make babies, um, nurture everything in sight, put aside our own needs for, you know, the, the family and at menopause, that hormone diminishes and another form of estrogen, estriol, rises. It stimulates the creative parts of our brain that make us want to, oh, go out and uh, dance that dance, paint that painting, write that book, start that business, whatever it is that, you know, our passion and our gift is. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when we come out of the hormonal trance, we really have so much more available to us. And, and we take up more space that we, you know, really deserve to have. And I think one of the important things to take in is how pleasure affects our body. Pleasure mm -hmm. and joy changes everything. If we can get into that mindset, our neurotransmitters change, uh, all of the, you know, chemical messengers in our body, everything works differently. And so I really like to remind women, this is your time, claim your space, claim your joy, put pleasure into your life and start to whittle away at some of the things you just do because you've been told, mm -hmm. you know, you got to do them. That's so. right. One of the other pieces regarding hormones that I found really interesting in the book was um, you wrote about the rise of testosterone mm -hmm. and that helped click some pieces into place for me because I found things that maybe in the past would have made me worried or sad mm -hmm. or scared were now just pissing me off. And a lot of them were steeped yeah. in expectations of caregiving and caretaking and selflessness and people please. And I was just like, I don't have time for this shit anymore. And I was like, what is wrong with me? And then I was like, oh, I read your book and I was like, oh, I just have like a lot more testosterone going through my veins right now. And I'm like, yes, I'm not taking this anymore. <laughs> yeah. And less estradiol and the two of them right. together kind of put us in this more neutral place where we can really see things in a different way. I mean, our hormones are so powerful. They powerfully change us at every transition in our lives. And most of us were not really conscious enough, aware enough to have perspective on puberty. We just went through the spin cycle, came out the other end, and there you go. But now we do have that perspective that we can bring to this transition. And mm -hmm. just like before, We'll go through it. We'll come out on the other end. We'll find our new footing as this new creature and we'll move forward. I mean, we've really got this. And while it may be a little trite, I really love the um, metaphor of the caterpillar and the butterfly because it really um, very literally applies here. They have exactly the same DNA. 
but they look different. They act different. Their impulse differently. Their destiny is different. The only thing that separates them is that time in the chrysalis when they get melted down into mush and then Mm -hmm. they come out as this new thing. And that's what our hormones do to us in a lot of ways when we go through these transitions. Right, right. One of the things that you talk about throughout the book, you know, kind of going back to what we were saying before, this lifespan developmental perspective is that the impacts of chronic stress and stressors and socialization and trauma, how that impacts our menopause transition due to adrenal fatigue. Yes. Um, and I, I, this was sort of my first exploration into that concept. And so um, can we talk about that a little bit? <laughs> and what do you do now <laughs> when you're in your late 40s and you're like, oh, my adrenals are tired? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, hopefully to begin with, I hope women will inform themselves, whether it's through this book or something else, about their adrenal system, their survival system, and what the effects of stress really are. Because we always, as women, are willing to put one more thing on our plate and just do it. And it builds up kind of like the frog, you know, that in a frying pan. And yeah, put it in cold water, slowly warm it up, it'll cook and die. But if you throw it into a hot pan, it'll jump out. So we've just added more and more things to that. But our body doesn't really distinguish um, between kinds of stress. It's stress or it's not stress. It can be good stress even. You know, mm-hmm. the woman that that loves her life, that wakes up at 5.30 so she can hit the gym before um, work, you know, fueled on her latte, works at a job she loves, goes out with friends at night, falls into bed at midnight and does the whole thing over again the next day her body's in a low level state of fight or flight all day long because every time it's triggered, it lasts for two to three hours. So um, we were made to run into a mastodon on the plane, have this tidal wave of hormones move through our body that will help us to run faster, fight harder, climb a higher tree, whatever we need to do to escape the danger. And then everything was supposed to come back to normal. So you could peacefully graze or, you know, whatever. But um, in our modern life, we're literally being triggered all the time by stress at work, sitting in traffic, the amount of caffeine we drink, um, not getting enough deep sleep, which is when the adrenal glands replenish themselves. You name it, we're kind of in stew and chew all the time. And so when women reach menopause, the whole system that was supposed to be there to catch the ball when the ovaries start to wind down is exhausted and can't do it Mm -hmm. because nature has made it such that the adrenal glands and the fat cells are supposed to take over making our hormones for the second half of life. Mm -hmm. And if we arrive at menopause with exhausted adrenals, it's just a spiral downward. Right. And I've had women say over and over, um, sure, I'm stressed, but no more than usual. And then I miss a couple of periods and all of a sudden, you know, hot flashes, night sweats, can't sleep at night, gaining weight, hair falling out. How can all of that happen just from missing two periods? Right. And of course, the answer is that's not all it was. It was everything that came before. So if women can start to put in even you know, sadly, it's our lifestyles are the hardest thing for all of us to change. Right. Um, But it's really what needs to happen in some ways, because, you know, for you can take hormones till the cows come home. But if your adrenals are exhausted, they're going to suck up all those hormones and turn them into stress hormones. And you'll still be left low in the estrogen and progesterone that you might need to have. So Mm -hmm. there are some very simple tweaks you can put in place that have a huge ripple effect. And the earlier you do that, the earlier um, things are back in balance and you can move through menopause more gracefully. And I've seen over and over again that the women who were proactive and came in to see me before they were going through everything to say, okay, how can we, um, how can we work with this? Right. They were then able to move through menopause without symptoms because they had put all the building blocks in place. Wow. Even something as getting to bed 
by 10, 10 30 at night so that you can get deep sleep or uh, putting, you know, creating a rhythm for your life so that you're not using up energy that you don't need to. Because mm-hmm. if you have a rhythm and your body knows when to expect you to be more active or to eat or to be more quiet, it can have the appropriate amount of energy in place for you at that time. Whereas if we're just random all over the place with what we're doing and how we do it, the body has to keep a high level of energy available for you because it doesn't know what's coming next. And that depletes the bank account, the energy bank account. Right, right. A couple of things I want to say in response to that. One, I I love that you framed um, a lot of that in this idea of good stress because I... I identify with that. You know, I I am a very motivated person. I have my own business. I have a couple kids and mm-hmm. you know, I have a lot going on and it's all stuff I love. You know, it's not it's not like I'm feeling burdened by these things, but I don't rest. My therapist would tell you how much I don't rest. Right. <laughs> you know, and that that and and to be able to see that too, to be like, it's not just the hard stuff that we face, but also the good stuff that taxes taxes our systems um, is really important to also acknowledge and, and being able um, to kind of get that rest. And there was a second point I wanted to make and I forgot what it was. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to hope that it comes back first, up. Yeah. I'll say the first one that... Um, You know, certainly if someone's experiencing um, like an abusive husband or not enough food or something Mm -hmm. like that, the bad stress, they also have that epigenetic burden of what that brings in to the body and to the consciousness. But yes, both of them are really true. And sometimes something as simple as making a good for me, bad for me list I love that exercise in the book. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You can open up a whole lot of insight that you don't even have in terms of what you you do do every day for Mm -hmm. other people. Or, you know, make a list of what in your life actually nourishes you, brings you pleasure, brings you joy, brings you peace. Make a list of the things that just suck up your energy and don't give anything back. Mm -hmm. And even include you know, small things like picking up your teenager's socks or something, how much of your day do you spend doing things for other people that they could be doing for themselves and probably would benefit doing from themselves? Right. Add more of the good stuff, less of the bad stuff, start delegating and making sure other people are being accountable. And then for the things in the middle, like many of us at in this time are both raising children and taking care of aging parents, or, Mm -hmm. you know, we're on a committee somewhere that we've committed a year to whatever. There are some things that, you know, you're not going to be able to get rid of, but you can set some boundaries around them. And there's some thoughts about how to do that in the book. Well, that was actually the thing that I was going to say that I forgot, um, was this idea of, you know, when I think about I am two weeks exactly away from turning 48. Congratulations. Thank you. And when my mom was 48, she had adult children and a grandchild. Mm -hmm. And I have ninth graders. (laughs) And it's it's very different. And I I often joke um, because my my younger child is a boy. and, And so I'm like, it's great. You know, he's going through puberty as I'm going through perimenopause. So we're getting facial hair at the same time. It's really fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like we're both getting a little, a little shadow on our upper lip and it's great to go through that together. Um, but when you talk about, you know, a lot of those stressors and I think about, you know, delayed childbearing in our current society and, and what is the impact that that has that people are waiting until later in life to have children. And so they're going through their perimenopause or menopausal transition while still actively parenting. Yes. And this is happening a lot. I was 45 when I had my child because I had been spending my years helping bring other people's babies into the world. 
And so I nursed her for a couple of years. And then it was soon after that, that I went through menopause and nature's idea is that you'll have all this hormonal support (laughs) for the nurturing that you have to do that comes after that. And when you're in menopause, you don't have that same kind of hormonal support. So Mm -hmm. that adds to the stressors because we still want to do a good job and we still are putting our children in front of ourselves. But you also have this impulse from your own hormones to want to be doing something for yourself, Mm -hmm. which I think can be a real benefit to a child to have a mother who's, you know, aware in that way and who's claiming her own space and that sort of thing. But it it can be a tricky tightrope dance. I would (laughs) agree. And I think overarching, I can at least speak for myself, my children have gotten a much better mom in her 30s and 40s than mm-hmm. they would have gotten if she was in her 20s and 30s <laughs> because oh, yeah. I didn't like myself very much until my late 30s. You know, I, I I can remember when those things started to coalesce for me where I was like, oh, no, I'm actually OK. And, and you know, I actually do like who I am. You know, I, I couldn't imagine what it had been like. Parenthood is so hard anyway, right? To to be raising children at that point where you're still second guessing yourself every mm-hmm. second of the day. <laughs> that would have just been that would have been awful. Yeah, and we yeah. want a strong container for our kids. You know, if the, if we're going to evolve as a species, we need to have children who are seen and held and nurtured and stimulated mm-hmm. to you know, become who they are. Because I think we all come in with something that we're meant to give to the world. We're here with purpose, I believe. And, um, you know, you want to be able to deliver that gift. Mm -hmm. So find, and this is a great time of life to do it, to find your authentic voice, to remember what your passion is that has been kind of damped down and hidden by the hormonal trance. And I've had a lot of women say, well, I don't even remember, you know, what lights me up. And I could say, well, think back to when you were 10. 10 year old girls are very clear about who they are and, you know, what they love. And you can find some clues there if mm-hmm. you remember. And you know, getting out old photographs or watching movies or whatever it is where you can sit back and look at yourself at a much younger age from a little more distance can give you a lot of clues to what was going on and bring up some memories. It's a very potent way of, you know, doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So I don't know if we've quite made the point. So we're going to, we're just going to put a real fine point on it right now. But the book is about menopause. And it's about everything else, right? If you had to, if you had to sum up what the book was about, would would menopause be the first word that you would use? Or is there something else? really wouldn't. And that's, um, yeah, which I think is a bit of a confusion for a lot of women when they look at it, they go, oh, menopause is probably about dealing with hot flashes and either I don't have them yet or I'm already done with that. Mm -hmm. But the book is really about the biological continuum of a woman's life and how it all unfolds and what nature's purpose is and how we can work with it um, in a culture that tends to try to work against it. And it's also a book of self-discovery. And as I said, if women pick it up earlier, not only will they know more about themselves and discover more about themselves, but they'll be better prepared as they age to be able to slide through it gracefully. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say while there is a lot about menopause, there's a lot about how our sexuality changes at menopause, how to engage in good self-care at menopause, a lot of those things apply to all of the continuum of our biological life. And we can glean things from them that will help us at any age. Yeah. One of the things that really stood out for me, um, by the time this episode comes out, I will have just recently aired um, a two-part series on sex and sexuality and, and talked a little bit in those interviews, just kind of about my own challenging past in Mm -hmm. figuring out who I was as a sexual person. 
um, Mm -hmm. where kind of parental and societal influences uh, aligned or didn't um, with how I saw myself and and the role of sex in my life. And some of the reflection points on that, you know, because you talk about sex through menopause, but you also talk about you know, how did you understand sex as a young person? How did you understand yourself as a sexual being? And I, and I felt like there was such a wonderful opportunity to start doing some of my own healing mm-hmm. around the places where those questions were fraught um, with shame or pain or fear or any of the, you know, kind of those negative things that, that some of us go through in our, in our younger sexual experiences Right. And how can we not in the culture we live in where everything is sexualized and women are, you know, it's put out so clearly that unless you're the sexy babe, you're worthless. And but also don't take advantage of your sexy babeness because it's not right. yours to own. It's a commodity. Right. Right. That's right. Yeah. So um, we come in with such really hard messages and in many ways is very difficult to be a balanced woman in our culture because of outside forces. So the more we know about ourselves, the more we ask ourselves questions, well, yeah, this is what I was prompted to do, but is that who I am? Is that what I wanted? Or Mm -hmm. did I even know what I wanted? And again, great time to figure this stuff out and to begin to act on it and be more who we are. Right, right, right. And to maybe mend those wounds if yes. they have been been with you for a long time. Like I think about, you know, being a highly sexualized adolescent and young adult and then completely like going in the other direction and be like, well, no, like I don't know how autonomous I was in those decisions. And some of that was a misunderstanding and all. And then coming back to center a little bit to be like, all right, well, maybe some of it was that I really just do like sex. And that mm-hmm. that's okay, right? Like you, we, I think we, we end up in this sort of double bind of you're damned right. if you do, you're damned if you don't. And being able to get to a place and being like, you know, young self, you're good. I see you and you're good and you're fine and you did nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. Again, it's a continuum and mm-hmm. to be able to, to claim all parts of ourselves or to even say, oh, I want to try something different now. I've been curious about this or about that. To be able to do it without shame and without um, feeling that it somehow labels us in a certain way, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, it's a great time to explore. Any time's a great time to explore. Right, At any right. age, I think we have such a richness of experience at this time of life to be able to look back and, you know, know ourselves better. It's a real gift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think one of my first experiences of, of knowing the word menopause and seeing it portrayed was, um, a a fairly well-known episode of the golden girls. Do you know what, Mm -hmm. what I'm talking about? Um, so the, the more, um, sexualized, character on that show, woman who very much loved men and having sex and, and enjoyed that enthusiastically, Blanche Devereaux. Um, she was a little bit of a hero of mine. She thinks she's pregnant and, and the character Mm -hmm. at that point is probably in her late forties and she thinks she's pregnant. And then she goes to the doctor and it turns out that she has menopause or she's going through menopause and, and it's portrayed. So first of all, it's kind of historically acknowledged as one of the first times that menopause was ever spoken on network television, (laughs) right? With a character actually naming it and experiencing it. But one of her reactions was complete devastation and grief because her Mm -hmm. life was over. Right. Right. And so if, if the fictional Blanche Devereaux is standing in front of you now saying, my life is over, I won't be attracted to men. I'm never going to have sex again because I've hit menopause. What would you say? Well, I'd say, you know what, (laughs) you've got this and it's going to be good because, you know, a lot of women even have enhanced sexual experiences as they get older. They know themselves better. Mm. They don't care as much about, oh, this is to please someone else or I want them to see me. I mean, often as younger women, women are even 
they're self-observing during sex and they're positioning themselves in a certain way so they'll look better or it's all about making him think they're great by doing this, that, or the other that their partner likes. And when we get older and we inhabit ourselves more fully, we don't care as much, we're more curious, um, it, it really is an enhanced experience. Now, it takes about 20 minutes longer for, of course, they've done studies on it, uh-huh, uh-huh. for a menopausal woman to um, reach orgasm. But so a lot of people, when they're just looking back at their earlier years and they don't have that information, they think, oh, it's not going to happen tonight and just get it over with and, <laughs> you know, let's, right. let's be done. But um, it gives us, it opens us up to this possibility of exploring so much. And there are a lot in those chapters about how a woman who hasn't had the opportunity in her life to know this can even find out, like, what really brings me pleasure? What do I really want? And one of the most important things at this stage is communicating with our partners because, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and our partners, whether they be male or female, are going through this as well. You know, they age as, you know, and change and their hormones change too. But in many ways, like women, men are made to think they have to be young and macho all the time, that sort of Mm. thing. So when you can talk to your partner and explore together what your future might be together, Mm -hmm. Um, those couples tend to do a lot better and they do really well, whether it's sexually or with their relationship in other areas. Mm -hmm. So communication becomes key because you think women don't know that much about menopause. Men know even less. So if they're, you know, if you have a man in your life and you're going through menopause, get him to read the book too, because, and I've had a lot of women tell me, I read this, I passed it on to my husband and he was so grateful because he had none of this information about a woman's body. And now he knows what's going on with his partner and can be supportive where she might need support. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also, I know this is not a universal truth for all people going through menopause and this is one of those fallacies, but I will take this as a chance to just plug the beauty and importance of lube. If <laughs> your perimenopausal or menopausal sex has become less fulfilling and or painful, lube is your friend. <laughs> lube can help. There are things that can help even more. Um, there is a, the estriol that lights up our brains for creative centers is really high in our bodies when we're pregnant and our vaginas are going to have to stretch a really long way. Mm -hmm. And that is the issue. It's not dryness as much as it is the tissue itself is not as elastic. And so you get all these little micro tears that cause pain. So estriol is not a proliferative hormone. It's not going to put you at more risk for cancer of anything. Um, And really estradiol doesn't either, but that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. But you can get online um, estriol suppositories to put in your vagina that actually regenerate the tissue so that it's elastic and lubricates itself again and it's no risk to you. So that's um, often what I suggest to the women that I work with. If they don't want to, for some some reason, lubrication definitely Mm -hmm. helps. But sometimes you still get the pain from the tissue being, um, yeah, Yeah. irritated. And I would have to think, um, well, not have to, this is my life, like sex without concern around pregnancy, like, Mm -hmm. yay. (laughs) It's like stress-free sex. (laughs) And it gives you a different, then you really take it in on a different level too. This is for our pleasure. Right. This is for our joy. And you start to look at it that way and move in directions that bring more of that to you. Yeah. 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 One of the words that you've used multiple times, well, two words have popped out that you've used multiple times in a variety of contexts are pleasure and curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I just think if that is the takeaway, that would be a beautiful takeaway 
to yeah. be in touch with your pleasure and be curious. Yeah. Yeah. Those are such yeah. great kind of fundamental places to start. Mm hmm. Yeah. What and I think is so important in relationship, especially with people who are a little different and than us, rather than having a reaction to something or being defensive, you know, if you can shift and be curious, where is this coming from? Why is this person acting this way? Why am I reacting this way? Right. And right. it can open a lot up. Yeah. Yeah. I also, I'm a, an absolute gratitude junkie and, mm -hmm. um, I find curiosity to be linked to awe and mm -hmm. awe is a pathway into gratitude. <laughs> yeah, and so I'm great. a big fan of, of curiosity just in that. I think it brings us, you, know, you were saying before, like it just brings us to a place where we can change our own brain chemistry by, yes. by getting in touch with the things that will release those neurotransmitters like endorphins and dopamine and the things that make mm -hmm. us oxytocin, the things that make us feel good. Like it just makes us yeah. feel good. Yeah. Yeah. Or of that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's just do nothing but that. <laughs> do you have particular tips or tricks that you share with people for learning to get back in touch with their sense of pleasure? Not just necessarily from a sexual perspective, but just in a moving through the world, let it feel good perspective. Well, as you've just brought up curiosity, like when we have a reaction that we usually have to something, be curious about it. Um, as I mentioned before, checking back in with your younger self to see what really lit them up. And I would say when you have a reaction, where in your body do you feel it? Because sometimes that can give you a little information about um, what started that in the first place. If you feel it in your gut, was it something that caused fear or something like that earlier? But otherwise, I'd say just, um, just explore. You know, you might have a wild idea or any idea, jot it down and try to make your dreams and desires actually appear in your waking life, mm -hmm. you know, do the things that you feel prompted to do. Yeah. And just experiment. Yeah. Explore. Yeah. There's a lot of space for that. There's a lot of space to kind of get in touch with those things again, if we just allow them to. But I think that that brings us back to sort of one of the points that we made earlier, which is when we are feeling so burdened, and so pulled in a million different directions, you know, whether it's work or child rearing or friendships or, you know, any of the things, but um, just really insisting that we're going to carve out that time for our yes. own creativity, our own pleasure, our own curiosity, you know. Make it happen. There's nothing more potent that you can do for yourself, really. Yeah, I agree. I always tell people, nobody's going to hand it to you. Nobody's going right. to walk up to you with a pocket of time and say, here, go do mm -hmm. something nice for yourself. <laughs> you know, like, everybody yeah. that you're in service towards is benefiting from that in some way. And so mm -hmm. through no malicious intent, it's in their best interest right. to not disrupt that. Right. And so and, we and have to also, say, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And it also becomes a habit. And I think it's important to look at what's become a habit in our lives as opposed to what um, is really alive for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's an important investigation too. Right, right. And all of those things kind of share one through line, I think, which is this idea of mindfulness, you know, being mm -hmm. awake and paying attention, right? You have to pay mm -hmm. attention to be curious. You have to pay attention to see if you're experiencing pleasure and you have mm -hmm. to be paying attention to break out of kind of these sleepwalking habits that we find ourselves in. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I feel like we have said a lot of stuff, Susan. We have. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything that we didn't get to anything that you wanted to be sure to share with the people or anything you wished I had asked you? Well, I just want to remind women, you've got this. You know, this is not something that's just going to fall out of the sky and happen to you. It's all part of a process that has purpose to it. And the sooner you engage with that process, 
especially if you can do it before you start having symptoms, the better it'll be. You'll be allies with what's going on and you can use the very real gifts that, that menopause bring to us. And I would say, tell your stories, gather your allies. Um, this is such a wonderful exploration and it can be that much better when you have other trusted people along with you. Mm-hmm. We're going to set up a menopause coven. Yeah, good. I love it. I <laughs> love here. it. <laughs> if the book were to have an alternate title, what would it be? Have you? Well, I don't know. I had several that I was working with ahead of time, working titles, knowing uh-huh. they would never end up being that. And, um, One of them, I think, was menopause as metamorphosis, because it was the whole idea that this time in life really changes us into a different being. Mm -hmm. And the other one was in in the shadow of the moon, how our earliest experiences shape our menopause. But the publisher really wanted something that screamed menopause. And so we worked a long time to get with something that we could both be okay with. Yeah. Oh my God. In the shadow of the moon just made me swoon. <laughs> I like that. That's my personal favorite. Too. That's a really beautiful title. We might make that the episode title. <laughs> we'll do yeah. that, maybe that'll be the, the episode uh, title for this episode because that okay. is fantastic. I absolutely, yeah. I absolutely love that. This book is such a gift. And, Thanks. and I'm so grateful to you for writing it, you know, first of all, um, and then just for, for being here and for sharing so much of yourself and your wisdom and your knowledge with our listeners. I think, um, I, we, I had told you, I think when we met for planning that a huge portion of our listener audience fits the, the demographic in that it's a majority, um, of folks who identify as female. And our age range tends to live in the 28 to 60 range, Uh which, I mean, that covers it. (laughs) Yeah, well, I hope it will be really useful to people. Um, The feedback I have gotten from people has been very positive, which I'm glad about. It means I'm getting my message across because I would really love to shift the way that our culture and that individual women look at this time of our life. I think, I think we're done being dismissed and we have so much to give and boy, does the world need the voice of mature women now more than anything. I mean, we see where the old white men have given, have gotten us and I love men. I'm not like putting them down, but we've been so imbalanced for so long. So yeah. we need women of a certain age to get out there and speak their truth and, make things happen. And it was a gift for me to write it. So um, it was part of my own journey. So I'm I'm really glad it's out there. Yeah, it's it's absolutely magnificent. And I'm I'm grateful to the friend that recommended it. I'm grateful to you for writing it. I want to share it with everyone. I want everyone to read it. Well, I, I hope really it's useful. And if they find it useful, I hope they'll pass the word along. Yes, that that's what we're hoping to accomplish here today. Oh, well, good. So, thank you so I much. I really appreciate you asking me to be on. I appreciate you saying yes. It took us a while to get here, but I am I'm absolutely delighted and grateful. And uh, I think that it is a book I will read more than once. And, mm-hmm. and as I mentioned before, uh, to, you know, listeners who are interested in picking it up, the, the prompts at the end of every chapter for deeper reflection are, in my opinion, probably the truest, uh, best gift of the book, because it mm-hmm. takes all of that really practical information, and it helps you apply it to your own self and your own life. And you use the term earlier in this conversation of self-compassion. And that's mm-hmm. just such a huge part of um, the work that I try to do. But also just, I just think it's such a, a benefit to ourselves to be able to just look at where we've been and where we are and where we're headed and just, you know, hold that all in empathy yeah. for ourselves, right? Which is what self-compassion I really think just is, is, is empathy for the self and and love and kindness and compassion for our own selves. Um, Mm -hmm. And those prompts really help to do that 
exact thing. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. So this has been such a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. And I look forward to being connected with you now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We will be right back after a short break. Thank you again to Susan for taking the time to appear on the show and having such a rich and insightful and wise conversation with me. If you're interested in joining my coven of gray-haired, finely wrinkled, softly rounded wisdom holders, you know where to find me. You can also send any topic ideas, questions, guest suggestions, or other commentary to Courtney at shineandsore.com or complete the contact form on shineandsore.com backslash podcast. Share this with your coven, whoever they might be. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you're listening. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. In the meantime, take care of yourselves and each other.